Okay, let's talk about electrons in the atoms. So more specifically, the structure of how electrons are arranged in the atoms. So some of you, the nucleus is tiny, but it contains most of the mass. The electrons take up a certain space where they exist outside the nucleus. We call it the electron cloud. And that electron cloud is by far the vast, vast majority of the volume of the atom, similar to comparing an ant to the size of a stadium. If the ant weighed millions of times more than the entire stadium, but uh, the idea is the electrons form most of the volume and they're outside the nucleus. Okay, like it says here, this picture is wrong. You probably recognize it. And we'll talk in a bit by why or about why this is wrong. But for starters, another bit of review the Rutherford's Gold Foil experiment. Remember that in this experiment, alpha particle emitter was placed in a box so that they were aimed this way and they came toward a foil of gold metal. And contrary to Rutherford's expectations, instead of all going through, some of them, a few, like one out of every 10,000 bounced off. Some by a little bit, some by a lot. And the idea was, hmm, how did he explain that? It was that, well, atoms must be mostly empty space. That would explain why most of them going through it. We now know that empty space would be the electron cloud. And why were some bouncing off? Because they were inter interacting with a small positively charged particle in the middle, which we would now call the nucleus, a.k.a. the protons and the neutrons. So that meant that's the observation that told us that atoms have a tiny nucleus and a large electron cloud on the outside. And then later on, we figured out through other experiments that that nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. So Rutherford's early model was this with the positive was the um, positive and the negative all um, more or less just kind of randomly spread. I should say it's not positive. It was positive, const positive concentrate in the center, negative more or less randomly spread. And that was, okay, so cool. That explained this experiment. But some other experiments were done later that called this in question of negative charge randomly spread and then a positive charge in the middle. And those experiments were this, putting electricity through a tube full of gas. If the electrons are randomly scattered, then what should happen is that you should get a random mixture of light given off. And if you remember, white light is composed of all the different colors. So if you put electricity in it, energizes these things enough to make light. If the atom, if the electrons are all the same, first of all, they should be behaving the same. So where did all these different colors come from? And second of all, you should get a random mix of colors anyway um, if they're randomly bouncing around and randomly located. So you should either be seeing all the same color or maybe just white because you have a random mixture of all possible colors given off by these. But instead, look, each different element gave off unique colors that was unique to that element and no other element. So something was clearly wrong with this model. And what was done was a further ref refining of that experiment by taking the light that came off of each of those glowing tubes of gas and putting it through a spectroscope, which uses a prism to break, you've seen it maybe breaking white light into a rainbow, and they use that to take the colored light coming off of these tubes and split it into what we call a spectrum. And a spectrum means that you try to split into a rainbow, but because it doesn't contain all the colors of the rainbow, instead of the full rainbow, you get only pieces of the rainbow, just little lines of light, one specific wavelength of light, another specific wavelength, another specific wavelength of light. And it looked like a fingerprint, and each element would consistently give the exact same fingerprint of particular wavelengths of light present. Whereas, if you compare it to a different element, the different element would always give a different fingerprint, and it would be very consistent. So the question was, why? Niels Bohr, an early 20th century physicist came up with an answer to that that involved um, the quantum model of electrons, so quantum energy levels. Now, what is a quantum energy level? It is this, saying that there is a nucleus, and then outside the nucleus, there are certain places where the atoms, electrons can exist, and they cannot exist in between. So they can exist at one energy level or another energy level, but not in between the energy levels. Sort of like if you climb a ladder, you can stand here or you can stand here, but you can't hover in between the steps. An electron in the atom can be at one energy level or another energy level, but can't exist in between. That could explain why there was only certain wavelengths of light given off, because the idea was 
that if these electrons are going like planets around the sun, just like around and around and around, then maybe as they jump around between energy levels, that's what's producing a different light. Now, let's expand on that idea of why would it be giving off light when you put electricity through it? Well, again, quantum energy levels were given as an explanation. We would say, based on the evidence we've seen since then, this is well over 100 years ago, we've seen many things to confirm that, yes, there are quantum energy levels, and the electrons cannot exist in between those energy levels. Which is the problem with this. This doesn't show energy levels. They're all kind of at the same distance from the nucleus, whereas different energy levels are at different distances from the nucleus, just like different planets are different distances from the sun. So that's wrong for that reason. Now, more explanation about why the electrons give off light and why this shows that there's energy levels. What we're able to figure out is going on is that electrons exist at what's called the ground state, a basic energy level that they are most energetically favorable to be in. And that's where they're going to stay unless something pushes them out. It's like a rock at the bottom of the hill. That rock will roll back down the hill unless you force it up. Well, you can force the rock up a hill or the electron to a higher energy level by adding energy somehow. Maybe you heat it up really hot. You think of like a piece of metal heated up in a point where it glows. Or think of electricity, like lightning causing the air to glow, because that's what a lightning bolt is. It's electricity heating the air enough and up to make it glow. So the gas molecule, if it gets hot enough, its electrons will go up to a higher energy level, and they'll stay there for a while. It's like rolling a rock up to the top of a hill. It might stay there a bit, but sooner or later it's going to roll back down. Likewise, this thing in its higher energy level will stay there for a time, and that's what we call the higher energy level, aka the excited state. But sooner or later, it's got to roll back down. Sooner or later, this needs to go back from here down to here. And when it does that, it will give off energy. It can't go down without releasing energy. Because ener absorbing energy brought it up, releasing energy takes it back down. Releasing energy takes the form of light. Absorbing energy does not make light, but releasing energy does produce light. And that's what makes atoms glow, is the idea that the, absorb the electrons absorb energy and rise to a higher energy level, and then as they fall back down, they release the energy in the form of light. And because hydrogen, for example, has only one electron for neutral hydrogen, then there's only a few ways that it can jump between one energy level and another, and each of those ways that it could potentially jump corresponds to one of the lines on the hydrogen spectrum, which is probably not too visible. There's one, two, three, four lines. Each of those corresponds to a potential jump the hydrogen's electron can do between its energy levels. Uh, okay, uh, there we go. Okay, so vocabulary. There's a couple words I brought up. Let's bring them up again. I said excited state. That is the raised energy level that an electron rises to after absorbing energy. Ground state is the base energy level that it started at and to which it will return after it releases the energy. So to review, electron absorbs energy, rises from ground state to some sort of excited state above where it began. It releases energy in the form of light and falls back down to wherever ground state it was at at the beginning. That's essentially what you want you guys to get out of this. And because different elements have different combinations of, well I should say different numbers of electrons, that gives each one a unique combination of ways for electrons to go from ground to excited and back to ground again. And more electrons makes more combinations, which is why the, the spectra tend to get more complicated, not always, but it often is more complicated as you add more electrons by making it a bigger atom. Okay, so here's the thing. This explanation of electrons go around the center like a planet around the sun worked well to explain these energy levels. And to this day, we know that Thiel was actually correct. Niels Bohr was correct about the energy levels. Everything we've ever seen since then has backed that up. However, there was other predictions that were made about the behavior of the way the electrons would interact with other things, the way they would react, like for say, example, you shine light on them, or the way they would react when you um, have them interacting with each other, the way they react with each other, that Mathematical predictions, complex mathematical predictions made did not stack up with what happened with helium, lithium, whatever. So question was, 
This is partially correct. It's working sort of, but not all the way, and especially not for larger atoms. So what's the deal? And these physicists, Erwin Schrodinger and uh, Louis Victor de Broglie, decided to take a different look at it because instead of looking at it as a planet going around the sun, as like a, a solid object, they decided let's treat it like a wave. A wave behaves very differently from a solid object. Like another example would be like a tennis ball. Or if I'm holding a tennis ball, it is here. It is nowhere other than here. A wave can be in multiple places at once. I mean, think of like the light waves from here. It's filling a whole area simultaneously. Electrons, they realize, can do the same thing. Now, they still have some particle-like properties, but they can exist in ways that don't match up with what we're used to thinking of in our daily lives. Like a tennis ball, if I hold the tennis ball, it is here and nowhere else, whereas a wave can fill an entire space at once. Electrons can fill an entire space at once. So they realize that when you talk about the places where electrons exist, not as orbits, which like a planet going around the sun, but as orbitals. And an orbital is something more akin to, uh, really it's a place where you might find the electron. So there's something called a Hamiltonian wave function, which is a mathematical calculation, wherein you do a mathematical calculation to plot on a three-dimensional graph where an electron can be, and when you solve it, you get an answer, and you plot it on the graph. When you solve it again, you get a different answer, and you plot that on the graph. And you solve it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and after a few thousand solvings, what you build up is a three-dimensional sphere, a picture of where it could be. And this is what our understanding of an orbital is. Now, Theoretically, the electron could be anywhere in the universe. It could go to Jupiter and back in a blink of an eye. And because the entire universe is a place where the electron could be, we can't just say, okay, it could be anywhere in the universe. We need to specify a location. So we take the top 90% of probable places and call that the orbital. And that would be what you've been seeing represented as the electron cloud around an atom, is the top 90% places where the electron is most likely to be. So... This is a spherical orbital. It doesn't look spherical, but it is round. They're not always spherical. As you get higher energy levels, they can take all kinds of dumbbell shapes and donut shapes, flower shapes, and other things. And um, I should add to that one other thing, that when we talk about the structure of an atom, you really have to think of it as a three-dimensional object, not this two-dimensional flat thing right here. So in a, in a way, planet around the sun is a terrible analogy. Let me actually show you a better analogy. Russian nesting doll. This is a better analogy for the structure of an atom. So there are different energy levels. There's a first energy level, a second energy level, a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth energy level. And each one is a three-dimensional shape, just like a Russian nesting doll. The Matryoshka is a three-dimensional shape. So just like this one, which fits inside 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 this one, could mean so that once you put them all inside, like imagine like, okay, they're all stacked inside of this one. An atom is the exact same thing. You have a three-dimensional shape, a first energy level, which is inside a three-dimensional second energy level, which is inside a three-dimensional third energy level, fourth energy level, fifth energy level, all the way on. The periodic table includes space for eight energy levels currently, um, or seven energy levels. We could potentially go up to eight and more. There's no real limit. So that's the idea of like, just understand an atom is not a two dimensional object. An atom is a three dimensional object like this. So to add one little, little bit of strangeness, I guess, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, one cannot simultaneously determine both the position and momentum of an electron. What that means is you can find it where it is, but not where it's going, or you can find it where it's going, but not where it is. Why mention this? Well, because it's the idea that we want to reinforce that electrons don't behave like the normal physical objects you're used to seeing in everyday life. But that scale of tininess, the universe just behaves different from ways that we instinctively understand as humans. So just understand that an electron, being that it has many properties in common with a wave, and like with light, for example, means that every model you've ever seen of a molecule or of an atom or of atomic structure, it doesn't show the pinpoint location of an electron. It merely shows these orbitals, which are places at the top 90% where the electron is likely to be. And I guess for now, that's good enough for what we're at. All right.